so our new paradigm is behavior and learning are determined by distinct strategies for processing information. The model for this goes back to Professor Noam Chomsky, who back in the late 60s, or early 60s maybe, late 50s, early 60s, um, came up with, he, he's a professor of linguistics at MIT, he came up with a new paradigm of linguistics called transformational grammar. And what he realized as he studied um, folks from around the world was a distinct pattern between what people experienced and what they said they experienced. Said being a reflection of their conscious experience. So, so he realized that there was this thing which he called the deep structure, the, to the total experience, and then there was the call it the subjective experience, the conscious experience, the individual experience, which was very incomplete. And he noticed there were patterns to this. And that these patterns were the result of very distinct processes, ways of processing information. Well, along came a couple of guys from, from California. One was a, a linguistics uh, major himself, and the other one was a computer programmer of all things. Uh, a couple of guys, Richard Bandler and John Grinder. And they realized was that if you changed that process that occurs between, um, let's call it the objective, the objective experience and the subjective experience, if you changed what happened between here, this was very different. And, the, and I think their proof of that was the behaviors, the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors changed, in some cases, dramatically. So the conclusion that they drew was that the, our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors were not related so much to this objective experience as they were this subjective experience. And it was true all over the world, regardless of language, regardless of culture. It was true regardless of age. It was true all over the world that this subjective experience is what generated consistently our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So they started looking at this. Um, they started looking deeply at a few guys like Milton Erickson, Virginia Satir, Fritz Perls, who were having some pretty good success making changes in people very quickly, very successful at, at, at generating change, rapid change. And he found that this was the level that they were operating at, whereas most the modern uh, the most therapies that we're familiar with, Gestalt, Freudian, transactional analysis, were all mostly considered, in my opinion anyway, my understanding, with this level, with thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. You go into counseling, you lay on the couch, and you talk about your feelings, and you, and you, ex you, you go through your thoughts, and you explain your behaviors. And then the therapist says, well, why don't you try thinking like this? Or what if you felt like this? Or what if you behaved like this? Right? And sometimes after a few years of that, of bringing up your behaviors and your feelings again and again and again, year after month, week after week, month after month, some people actually do change. But it, it can be really kind of a agonizingly slow process. Whereas what Bandler and Grinder found was you change this, this changes automatically. <laughs> Not only that, you can change this without the person even knowing it. <laughs> Which they were pretty good at. <laughs> There's some pretty famous stories about the two of them in different, you know, doing different things with different people. And I mean just creating change really fast, really dramatic. Sort of traveling um. world wreaking havoc, where they 
<laughs> kind of. They would walk into, well, I mean, this was a different time, but, you know, they would get permission to go into, like, you know, like state mental institutions and, um, and just, you know, mess with people in different ways, um, just kind of seeing what the results right. were. And, and some of them were a little crazy, but some of them were really impressive, um, what they were able to do for people that had been, in, you know, in some cases, like, catatonic for three years or, or just really, I mean, whacked out, antisocial or whatever. Um, really amazing stuff. And then, you know, they wound up actually working, some, doing some pretty good results um, with, with people in different, different areas and uh, whatnot. So, um, anyway, so that's, that's what got me interested, was that the, the way you could make rapid changes for folks by working at this level, at the level of information processing. I just want to write down process. Process, process, process. So, so, um, so that's where I'm at in this in this new paradigm is that um, we have very complex brains. Um, I usually have my brain around here somewhere, um, and I like this model because it it shows we have you know two hemispheres, two halves. I mean, it really is odd. You know, I think of all the things that could we would the, the way we would evolve. Why why would we evolve with two completely separate brains, two separate brains? And, and the only thing that connects them is this bundle of nerves called the corpus callosum. In a lot of ways, there's, they're the same. They're, they're very redundant. Um, there have been a few cases where someone literally didn't have half their brain, and this half would, would compensate. Um, there's also some pretty famous experiments done with, um, I think the most common were with folks that had um, epilepsy. A very good friend of mine in, in San Francisco had severe epilepsy. So what they did was they cut the corpus callosum so the two halves couldn't talk to each other. Not sure what that has to do with epilepsy, but it was, anyway, it was some theory that it would help. So, so the two halves couldn't talk to each other. So I had my left brain over here, my right brain over here. Remember the right brain, visual, spatial, really kind of uh, understanding what, what to do, like what things are for. And the the left side has got that little verbal side, right? What things are called, right? The symbolic representation. So, so they wound up having seen some pretty interesting results. So they would show someone, um, they would have someone cover up, say, their right eye. And, and if you all know this, if you remember, we're cross-wired. So the left side of the brain is connected to the right side of the body. The right side of the brain is connected to the left side of the brain. So, so they would cover up the right eye. They're looking at the, the pen with their, their left eye connected to the right brain, and they would go, oh, yeah, yeah. The, you just, you, I, they pick it up and write with it. Okay, and what's it called? They couldn't say. But they would cover up the left eye. They would look at the pen with the right eye and go, oh, that's a pen. I know what that's called. It's a pen. What do you do with it? Mm, I don't know. So how does good learning occur? When does good learning occur? Does it occur when we're processing information with one side or the other? Or does it really, does good learning occur when both sides are working and talking to each other? Yeah, yeah. So let's go back to the, remember that, the guy living in the, on the Serengeti, that hunter child. Well, when, when we get very active, when our sympathetic nervous system gets activated, our fight or flight system gets activated, um, and we have two sides of the brain. One of them is very visual spatial, processes 30 images per second or more, and the other side is very slow, it's kind of that internal voice, and processes information at about four words per second. Well, if you're in a fight or flight situation and you have to respond instantly, which side of the brain do you want to respond to that situation? The quick one, yeah. So if if you live, kind of live, if your if your way of being in the world is in that sympathetic mode, you're going to tend to think with your right brain, very quick, very boom, 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 right. But that left side is going to be pretty quiet. It's it's really not going to be there for you to help organize and 
and structure things and give you that that kind of especially in that 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 the way our school system has evolved presenting information very orderly and neat and how to and step by step right so you're going to be awesome on the soccer field you know you're going to be awesome at football you're going to be a little bored for baseball <laughs> way too slow <laughs> way too slow way th unless you're a pitcher or a catcher okay um so you're going to have some really mad skills, video games, snowboarding, skateboarding, you know. You're probably going to like science because it's it's really there. It's kind of, you know. When they let you do the hands-on stuff. It's Not hands the book stuff. The book stuff. Yeah, the book stuff is kind of boring. But, you know, yeah. like chemicals and blowing things up and, 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 you know, things moving and volcanoes and stuff like that. So um, you're going to have some skills, but... But in a classroom that's visually stale and very verbal and orderly and step by step, you may find you're at a real disadvantage. Intellect, high. Performance in that classroom environment, not so high. Does that make sense? Got it. Um, Learning is a natural process. Children are wired up to learn. It's almost an insult to teach a child something. Has anybody ever noticed that? When you try to teach your kid something, it's insulting. But if you do something and let them watch you, they'll pick it up like that. Mm -hmm. In fact, you can't keep them from picking it up. In fact, I think 80% I think of what kids get in trouble for is imitating their parents. Okay? This is my opinion. Um, but they're natural born learners. Um, and... We, we, you know, we have these complex brains, genetics, nature, it's all in a swirl. Um, we all have, just like we all have different bodies and different strengths, intellectually we have different strengths. Um, and different types of information require different strategies in order to be effective. One size does not fit all. We don't, like I say to my kids, um, you know, we don't all go to Walmart and buy the same size pants. You know, it just wouldn't work too well. So different types of information, reading and, 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 and say history, is a very different type of information than say chemistry or math or, or um, Halo 3. <laughs> um, so powerful learning occurs when the strategy to process that information matches the type of information and the natural abilities or learning style of the individual. That's when really powerful learning occurs. When you, when you put those two together, boom. So that's why this is not a one-size-fits-all program. It's not. I, 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 at least I can't get it to be. And I've tried really hard. But, but it still comes down to tweaking it for each child and, and, and each individual and different types of information. Um, how do you know when learning is, is, is working? Well, it's easy, fast, and fun. There you go. You know, when a child is frustrated and they're, they're starting to push you away and, and their tempers are going up, something's wrong. That's a communication and it's really clear. Yeah. <laughs> it's really clear that this isn't working for me. Now does that get more complex as we get history and we get repetitive failures and expectations and whatnot? Yes, it can, it can be tough to sort out what's here and what's, what's coming up from the past. It's, it's just residual from past experience. Um, and uh, yeah, kids want to be successful. When they're able to be successful, they're much more likely to be excited and willing to do something. Um, I like this. Your focus determines your reality. What you focus on is what you get. If you focus on everything, all the problems in your life, and everything going wrong, if that's what's got your attention and your focus, it's going to feel like life sucks. And, and if your focus is outside on the maintenance guy, 
and the teacher's talking about, um, you know, pre-algebra or, or, you know, the Earth's, you know, creation of the continents or something like that, you're not going to, you're not, that's not going to have any reality for you. It's going to be on whatever the maintenance guy did that day. But how do you get a kid to focus in class? I mean, there, is there... We're going to get to that. We're going to, we're actually going to get to that. I don't even have ADHD and I've always been that way just because it's so incredibly boring whatever they're saying up there that... Right. You know, even though this guy's picking gum off the wall, it's way more exciting than... Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So, I mean. so, but... But see, that's telling us something. It's there's something about that that's engaging you. It's exciting. Something about the classroom is not it's exciting. Not really exciting, but comparatively, comparatively it is. It is. <laughs> yes. So that we're going to look at that. Why okay. is that? Um, so 22, this flow of information. Okay. There's our there's the experience, which is the same for all 30 kids in the classroom. They're all seeing the same thing. But for some reason, 26 of them are perfectly happy. Well, I would, maybe it's not that way anymore. But let's just say that 26 of them are pretty satisfied and content to sit there and pay attention to the teacher and hear what she has to say and take it all in and regurgitate it back next week for the test. But four of those kids, <sighs> it's mind-numbingly boring, picking gum off the sidewalk or somebody taking off their shoes or playing with their pencil or whatever is way more interesting. So we perceive it differently. We, we, have, we all have our, our unique way of taking that information in, processing it, and arriving at a personal experience that's very, very unique to us. And out of that experience comes our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are always and forever correlated to how our subjective experience. And then we get our results. So, characteristics, basic learning style. And I, in my experience, have simplified it down to two learning styles. And anybody who's done any teaching or whatever education says, well, wait a minute, there's three, there's kinesthetic. Okay? In my opinion, in my opinion, there is no Yes, there's there's feeling things, but I don't know really of anyone who learns, except for maybe somebody who's blind, really kinesthetically. It's not a primary way. It's a good way, see, it's a good s secondary strategy to create a visual spatial model. If I can't see something, I can feel it. I can bump up against things. Guy, boys really especially, they like to bump up against stuff. They want to feel where those boundaries are. Boom. So I think, and, and it's worked pretty well for me in my model, that kinesthetic is a offshoot of a visual spatial learner, a visual spatial thinker. If, if you can use the kinesthetic to help develop that picture, great. But I think the ultimate goal is that visual spatial memory. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so, um, if you want, my, my estimation is that that left side, you can write this down, that left side, that left hemisphere auditory learning style makes up about 80% of folks today. And I don't mean that 80% of the folks are auditory learners, I don't believe that, but I think 80% of the kids will do well with a basic auditory learning style. They'll do well, they'll do okay. Um, twenty percent will do really well. Another twenty percent will do pretty well, and another twenty percent will do well in some areas and not so well in other areas. And the last twenty percent, they're on their own because they don't they don't live there. They don't get it. They don't understand it. They just don't live there. And it and in my opinion, in that big box that that PDD box, pervasive development disorder box. It doesn't matter where you are in the box. That's why I don't care about diagnosis. I don't care if you have a diagnosis. I don't care what the diagnosis is. If you're somewhere in that box, if you're somewhere up in that, that right brain thinker box, that you're going to be struggling. You're going you're gonna to have some kind of struggle. Um, and you're going to have these really cool things. 
you're going to be interested in the big picture. What boss, what successful manager doesn't need to see the big picture? This is why companies make the mistake that sometimes of promoting people inside the company or they go outside the company because people who, who are good at task, if they're task oriented, if they're good accountants, they may suck as strategic managers because they can't see the big picture. They can't make that adjustment. They're interested in the components. They see things in discrete boxes. They're not going to be good puzzle solvers or problem solvers or strategic planners. Does that make sense? So you're, you're the guys that are going to make really good outside the box creative thinking managers are going to be your right brain learners. Oh. <laughs> I think she wants the apple. <laughs> God. Oh, this apple? <laughs> she was watching you when you moved that around. She's like, hey. <laughs> oh, she can it have it. It made the noise. She can have it. Um, I won't need it till tomorrow. Um, they detect patterns, which is very different than detecting features. See? And how is science explained? Well, oxygen has these features. Nitrogen does, has these features. It's all in these discrete little boxes. Whereas, here's what, here's, here's the way oxygen behaves, and here's the way, he, and if you look at these, you see patterns in how, how this group of, of atoms behaves, and, and how this group of insects behaves. And, or, you know, in my case, I saw that under these conditions, you know, um, bids came in 20% high or 15% high or 10% low, you know, depending upon the condition. And I saw patterns in, in uh, anyway, um, holistic processing rather than sequential processing. This is the outside the box creative thinking that gives us a light bulb or you know, a television or, or iPod or Google. So that's when they get ideas that kind of comes from all directions like this? Yes. Instead of like what stats look like it all comes Right, from. exactly. Exactly. So, so one of these is very Newtonian. Action and reaction. That's the left brain. Not that Newton was a left brain thinker. I think he was brilliant. But, but Newtonian thinking is very step by step, orderly. Okay, as opposed to let's call it um, quantum thinking, which is you jump from here to there. You, you, it's it's very swirly. It's chaos. But but you know um, I, I hate to use that quote because it's so you know overdone. But you know what was it Nietzsche said out of out of chaos comes order, right? Um, I don't know if I believe that's true, but there are answers, results that can come out of chaos. Um, and so that, that holistic processing has its advantages and it has its disadvantages, okay? If you're gonna, if you're gonna come up with creative solutions, you wanna be able to pull information from the past and the future and the present from here and there, from this category and that category, and you wanna mix them all up and you come up with solutions. But what if you live like, what if you can't turn that off? And what if your way of experiencing the world is everything and happening at once? And it's all a swirl and you can't sort it out in your head. Might that be a bit overwhelming? Yeah. Yeah. So, so all these things, they have a kind of a positive aspect and a, and a flip side, a, a negative aspect, depending upon whether you're using it or being used by it, and I think um, as a group, what what you know this group here that I raised, um, I think if there's something that drives them, you know, as a group to that substance abuse or to that self medication, whatever, it's feeling like you you're a victim of your own thinking, like you can't control your own thinking. Well, heck, if there's one thing on the planet that you should be able to control, it's your own thinking. It's the one place where you have total freedom. Nobody can control you. So, so it really does kind of suck if you feel like you can't control your own thinking. So, okay. Um, we talk about the visual spatial thought process, experiencing the world visually, very dynamically, 30, 32 images per second. 
um, you know, 500, and you know a picture's worth a thousand words, so, you know, you're talking about something that processing information 500 times faster than anybody can talk, which is like, you know, a good thing, or mind-numbingly boring in, the, <laughs> in another situation. Um, experiencing the past, present, and the future all at once. This can be, this can be trouble, troublesome, overwhelming. Um, intuitive. Um, a lot of kids and parents have the experience of um, the child comes up with an or the person comes up with an answer or a response. Well, how did you know that? I don't know. Where did you get that answer? I don't know. It's very intuitive because at the speed at which they're processing information, a lot of answers will come, you know, out of that unconscious realm. You're not going to be aware of of that thought process, but it is happening. Um, reactive rather than responsive. You know, again, good soccer player, good football player, good police officer, you know, sniper, whatever. You know, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a doctor. I want to be. I want to be a sniper. Yeah. You know. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's sometimes that's like you know. Okay, I know his learning style. You know. <laughs> Um, impulsive, um, and again, that's that mind, that visual body, that mind-body connection. When you're processing information visually that fast, you see it, feel it, boom, instant. See it, feel it, see it, feel it. Or for some, not necessarily women, but see it, buy it. <laughs> and that is a problem for some people. Yes. Um, and now you have a solution. If, you, if you're going to be working with adults, you have that see it, buy it, see it, buy it. No. You, you have to change the process. You change the process. See it, analyze it with the other side of your brain, then decide whether to buy it. Oh, well, yeah, it looks good. That pair of shoes looks good, but am I ever going to wear it? Uh, no. <laughs> um, sympathetic dominant. Uh, and this is something that came from a doctor. I, I heard it, and I really liked it. Um, we they we live in that sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight system. That's we're just wired up. We're we're on alert all the time. Um, What's an S? Nervous system. Oh, okay. Nervous system, and and we go from one extreme to another. Either we're hyper alert, or we shut down. We go internal. What's and, th and you see this more the further up the uh, autistic scale you go, the further up. On this, on that PDD scale, um, the, the further away you get from that middle ground of balance left and right, you see more and more they go internal. They go internal. The the what I've found is working with kids is not only are they processing 30, 30, 32 images per second, but they can have multiple images on their screen, if you will, and each image is taking on a life of its own. So if you want to imagine. Try this. Close your eyes. You can all pretend to, pretend to be ADD for, for a little bit. Um, um, uh, thinking in pictures. So imagine, divide up your, your screen, if you will, into four quadrants. In the upper left, put a car. In the upper right, a boat. In the lower left, a train. And in the lower right, a plane. So you have a car, a boat, a plane, and a train. Okay? Now, send them all on a journey and watch all four journeys all at once. Keep going. Come on. Try it. Stay in there. Just try to keep track of all four of those at once. And change your perspective. Look at the car and the boat from different angles as you're watching them. See them from the top, the side, the bottom. Zoom in, zoom out. See if you can keep all four of those going for a while. If you can, you're, you're honorary ADD. <laughs> Maybe earlier in the day. But, <laughs> but that's a lot. That's almost like what's going on. Yeah. Um, another one I do for folks is I say, now, when, you do, when you're driving your car, start looking at everything as fast as you can, pick out objects, and imagine what that object looks like from the top, the bottom, and the sides, all as fast as you can, and do that. Try to do that for five minutes. Now you know what it's kind of like to be autistic. <laughs>
So, are ADHD people, are they better drivers or worse drivers? I mean, with the, you know, because in some ways they're more reactive, in other ways they're very distracted. I mean, you, you, you hit it exactly so on the head. Either way, so, so every accident I've ever had in my life is because I was doing too many things at once. Right. First accident, my sunglasses fell off the mirror. I reached for them as I, as I was turning. Boom, telephone pole, clicked the end of the car. The last accident I had, which is kind of ironic considering the law change, I was screwing around with my Bluetooth. Uh, yeah. And the, the traffic shifted from 50 miles an hour to a dead stop, right. and boom, there you go. Right. So, so, in, in, so that's, my, that's my weakness. But when I'm, when I'm in the that's zone, right. when I overload my senses so that I am absolutely focused, and I see every everything car, going everything. on. Yeah. I know I know what's happened. I'm looking at the intersection that's coming up and what might happen, what might right. come through, right. who might turn. Right. I'm seeing all that, taking all that in at once. Right. And what, who's behind me, who's in front of me, how many cars, how close, who's to my left, who's to my right, where do I go, where can I move, okay? Are there any cops in, within a mile and a half? Right. Okay, when I'm, when I'm in that zone, it may not look like it, because right. my driving may not appear to be normal, but I think it's actually really safe. Right. I think I'm, I'm like a right. really, really safe driver when I'm in that zone. Right. Um, so I shouldn't be terrified about my son driving. I keep having this, because it's going to be coming up, and I keep having these thoughts in my head of, you know, is he going to get distracted by every little thing? Is he well, let me, let, me, let me give you the bad news. I had 12 cars the first two years I had my license. <laughs> yeah. In two years, I went through 12 cars. Yeah. So it's a learning curve. It's an age thing. It's, a it's an age <laughs> thing. It's knowing you're not indestructible anymore. It's, it's, so it's having you know a family that depends on you. I mean, there's a lot so of factors. Get married and have getting, kids. you know, <laughs> keep him home until he's 40. He'll be fine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about when my husband tough. started to slow down too when he hit about 40. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, he's got some good skills to keep if he keeps focused right. on the road. You and you learn to keep take all that in. Right. Same thing in the classroom. If you overload the guy's senses, get him focused in in a way that that the information, even though it's on one hand, it's kind of mind-numbingly slow, is words, but if you take those words, I'm just going to throw this out there, if you take those words, right, mm -hmm. this is the objective experience, the words, and you process that information as multi-sensory visual spatial images, ooh, ooh. You might even be more interesting than the guy peeling gum off the sidewalk. So you got all those images in your head for all those different things. And yeah. Yeah. And there's a couple of ways we have of kind of overloading the nervous system okay. so that you switch modes. Right. You switch from the sympathetic nervous system to the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, does that all make sense? Yeah. All right. How are we doing? 7.15. I really want to see if I can get you guys out of here by 8 o'clock the first night. Okay, so we, we've already looked at this, the autonomic nervous system, which is, you could call it the automatic ner nervous system. It's connected to all the parts of our body, the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, the digestion. Everything that works automatically. Everything that works automatically. But here's the cool part. It's completely redundant. It has a whole dual set of nerves and one of them is the, the sympathetic nervous system, and the other is the parasympathetic nervous system. Depending upon whether, whether we are relaxed or excited, some kind of nervous, nervous excitement, we are going to be firing those chemicals and those neurons and all that of one or the other. And look what happens. In that sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight, our, res our fast response, our, okay, what happens when we're, when, so anything, fear, anger, stress, anxiety, nervousness, okay, fight or flight, um, we are, our, our digestion slows, right, you don't want to waste energy on digestion if you've got to run for your life, right, our healing slows, our growth slows, right, so, so we're channeling all the energy to our muscles, 100, 
the blood flow and, and oxygen in, increases to our muscles. Um, our pupils dilate to let in more light so we can see better in the dark. Um, uh, our, our face flushes, um, changes color, the, the, the blood flow to our lips changes. Okay, This is all so that we can respond instantly to a situation physi physi physically, physiologically. But what also happens to the brain? The brain goes into a fight or flight, or what I call the, your puzzle solving mode. Left brain shuts down, gets very quiet. It's not useful when you have to respond quickly. And our right brain does goes into its puzzle solving mode, okay, which is great for responding and react or reacting instantly to a situation, but not for remembering what happened in that situation because that's not relevant to our survival to a certain degree. Um, does that make sense? Converse. Oh, also when we're wired up, when we're either chasing our food or trying not to be food. Notice what our eyes do, okay? Because we, we do have binocular vision. We are wired up, and you can see kids in school that are like this. They're, they're like little bobblehead dolls, right? <laughs> Their heads are going all the time. They're looking around, looking here, looking there. Why? Because when they're in that parasympathetic mode, they're wired up <laughs> to look with binocular vision at whatever catches their attention. Why? Because with binocular vision, you can judge speed and distance. See? So you can be in the sympathetic mode, and you're automatically going to want to look at things you know, that you hear or see or out of the corner of your eye with both eyes to confirm speed and distance. Um, or you can circumvent that process because there's you know all this feedback in the body what if you consciously don't look at everything what if you let's say pick a spot on the wall and just focus in on the spot on the wall and ignore everything around you so you're aware that all this stuff is going on around you but you're just ignoring it well guess what you actually trick your nervous system into thinking that everything's okay. Is that cool? So you actually switch your nervous system, all other things being equal, you switch over from the sympathetic nervous system to the parasympathetic nervous system. So why did you just put so much stimulating stuff all over the walls? Every classroom you go in, it's just covered in all kinds of posters <laughs> and pictures and just anything and everything to distract to keep, Well, to keep, try to keep their attention. It's to try to keep their attention. Because I would think that would be it's more the, It's exactly the flip side of putting a child in a room with nothing but a chair and a desk. Right. And saying, okay, now take your test. Thinking that, like, he's not going to find the lint on the floor right. and the cracks in the ceiling <laughs> and the spider in the corner. <laughs> you, couldn't, you can't empty a room enough for us. Right. Okay, we will find something, you know, the, you know, the dirt under our fingernails yeah. or the cuticles or whatever. We can, we'll make something up, okay, internally or externally. So, so, but the, but the intention is good. The intention is to provide a stimulating environment. It just doesn't work for us. Because after the third day, it's all the same. Right. You know? <laughs> it's the same classroom. Yeah. Unless you change the posters on the all walls all the every time. day. Right. By the third day, I figured it out. Okay, yeah. I know. I know whatever, you know, I know what he said, and I know what she did, and I know what's over there. That's it. Now we're back to words. The least interesting thing in the universe to someone with ADD. To a high visual, to a visual thinker. It's the least interesting thing in the whole world. So, anyway, we're going to talk more about that, that, that playing with the nervous system later on. <coughs> All right. By the way, this also explains why nobody can exhibit the symptoms of ADD all the time. Okay? If you did, you'd be dead. You'd be skinny and short and dead. Does that make sense? Cause you have to sleep. You have to rest. You have to digest your food. At some point, go, 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 go,